lecture, we'll talk about three types of experimental designs that are used in social research studies. Just to refresh your memory, there are two key features of experimental research. These are manipulation and control. Manipulation refers to the ability of the researcher to control exposure to an experimental treatment. So the researcher manipulates whether or not study participants are exposed to some type of treatment. The second feature of control is achieved through random assignment into study groups. This allows random assignment allows the researcher to make to be confident that the experimental and the control groups are similar to one another in their characteristics. And so any observed differences um, after the experiment is conducted between the study groups, the researcher can be confident that those differences are due to the treatment exposure and not due to other extraneous factors. There are three types of experimental designs that are commonly used in social research studies. These include pre-experimental designs, quasi-experimental designs, and true experimental designs. I've highlighted each of these three experimental designs in red, orange, and green to highlight their relative degree of internal validity. Pre-experimental designs have, relative to the other two, the weakest evidence in terms of internal validity, whereas true experimental designs have the highest level of internal validity because of the features of random assignment and manipulation of the treatment exposure. In true experimental designs, researchers can be most confident that any difference um, after the experiment is mainly due to manipulation of the treatment exposure and not due to other extraneous characteristics, where in pre-experimental experimental designs and quasi-experimental designs, the researcher might have less confidence. We'll talk about an example of each of these three experimental designs. For the pre-experimental design, we'll talk about the one-group pre-test, post-test, or the single-group pre-test, post-test. For quasi-experimental designs, we'll talk about the non-equivalent control group. And for true experimental designs, we'll talk about the pre-test, post-test control group design. For pre-experimental study designs, one of the most commonly used designs is that is the single group or one group pre-test, post-test. In this type of experimental design, a researcher um, makes two measurements. They make a measurement prior to the subjects receiving the treatment, um, which I've labeled the independent variable x, and they make a second measure or the post-test again after subjects receive the experimental treatment. And what this allows you to do is if you take the difference between the post-test and the pre-test scores, again, you're thinking about administering the same measurement um, before and after a group of participants receives some type of experimental treatment. And so the difference in the measurement scores can be presumed to be an experimental effect. In quasi-experimental designs, the researcher um, adds a control group of participants who do not receive the treatment. So similar to the pretest post-test design in the previous slide, both groups receive two measurements, a pretest measurement and a post-test measurement, before and after um, some type of experimental treatment, um, but only the treatment group receives a treatment. The control group does not receive the treatment. And so what this allows you to do is any observed difference between the treatment group and the control group can be presumed to be due to the experimental effect. The highest level of evidence is the true experimental design. Um, and, and the best example of this is the pretest, post-test control group. And this might look somewhat similar to the quasi-experimental design with the control group, but what's different with the true experimental design is that you take an entire pool of eligible subjects, and these subjects are randomly assigned into either a treatment group or a control group.
and th any difference in the ex um, measurement scores between the post-test and the pre-test um, between the study groups can be presumed to be due to the experimental effect. And the internal validity, um, the confidence that the researcher can have that the study results reflect social reality, um, they have, can have the highest level of confidence in the study results because the two features of experimental designs are honored, that of manipulation to a treatment exposure and random assignment into study groups. There is another type of quasi-experimental design that's often used in social research, and this is called the interrupted time series design. In an interrupted time series design, the researcher makes several measurements before and after exposure to treatment X. This is also done in a multiple time series where you follow maybe two groups or even uh, three or more groups at several measurement points before and after some type of experimental treatment exposure. Um, and what this allows you to do is any observed changes after the in the measurements that are conducted after the treatment exposure could be hypothesized to be due to the um, manipulation of the treatment exposure. Um, and you might expect not to see um, changes in the group that in the control group that does not receive the treatment exposure in measurements four, five, and six, those measurements that occur after the hypothetical treatment. So a good example of an interrupted time series was presented in the Journal of the American Medical Association. In this journal, the researchers looked at the rate of uninsurance in the United States. So this is the proportion, the percentage of Americans that do not have health insurance. And what's interesting is that the dotted vertical lines, the dotted blue vertical lines on this figure represent two points in history. Um, the first point in 1965 was, was when the um, Congress created Medicare and Medicaid programs which provided, uh, which were large government insurance programs to provide health insurance for both the elderly as well as um, poorer Americans. And the uninsurance rate dropped dramatically after the creation of Medicare and Medicaid. There was also another precipitous drop in the years um, after the Affordable Care, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as um, Obamacare, was passed in 2010. Um, many of the main provisions were um, took were kind of enacted or took effect in 2014. So that's why the the dotted blue line, dotted blue vertical line is in 2014. And there was a, a pretty dramatic drop in insurance coverage, I'm sorry, in, in the rate of uninsurance after many of the ACA provisions took effect. Um, so this is a great example of a time series where a researcher can pinpoint some type of event and take several observations before and after those events occurred to see whether um, there are changes in the measurement after the um, events took place. There are several threats to internal validity that can occur in experimental designs. These include history, maturation, testing, instrumentation, statistical regression, and differential attrition. In history, there might be extraneous events that occur in the study participants' environments other than the manipulated treatment variable. So when these extraneous events occur, they could be presumed to affect the measurements um, before and after so study design, and it could be an, um, an alternative explanation for any observed findings in the study. Maturation refers to any psychological or physical changes that take place within the participants of a study. Um, so especially, this might be especially relevant for children, for adolescents, for young adults, where they're undergoing rapid psychological and physical changes, and that these could be an alternative explanation for study findings or experimental results. In testing, researchers have observed that sometimes when you um, take multiple measurements of the same um, um, factor or skill 
um, this is particularly relevant in educational testing, they notice that sometimes um, people tend to get better scores the second time they take a test versus the first. And so the the researchers might find that t just the simple fact that people are getting better at taking tests that are making up the measurements might be an explanation for any experimental findings. Instrumentation refers to unwanted changes in measuring um, instrument or procedure. So if there are changes in the way that um, measures are collected, the instruments that are used to collect measurements in an experiment, the, any, the changes that are observed across measurements might be due to the instrument that's employed or the study procedure that's used to um, c collect those, that measurement data. Statistical regression refers to the, when study participants score, um, have high, uh, very extreme scores on a um, on a particular measurement, and what they find is that extreme scores tend to reg um, move closer to the mean. So they might, if if they're extreme low scores or extreme high scores, eventually, um, what researchers find is that these people move closer to the average score for a study population. And so, if you are, if your study participants tend to be extreme scores um, as a group. Um, there might be an experimental effect that's observed in the measurements might be due to statistical regression or regression to the mean. Finally, uh, another important threat to the internal validity of study designs is the loss of subjects from experimental groups. And this is particularly um, problematic when attrition, which is the loss of subjects, occurs differentially between study groups, so that such that maybe control group participants are more likely to drop out than experimental group participants. Differential attrition can be a major um, threat to internal validity. Uh, this was a case in a study that I conducted where we were evaluating a program and we used the pre-experimental one-group pre-test post-design to look at changes in subjective health and wellness of people who are participating in a post-disaster recovery program um, for people in the Rockaway, living in the Rockaway Peninsula a few years after Hurricane Sandy hit New York City. And one of the issues um, in, in this particular study was that we were able to enroll 732 participants into the program. However, only due to attrition, only 455 of the original 732 or 62% of participants actually completed the post-test at the completion of the program. So a large, there was significant attrition in um, people as they moved through the study and they were uh, a lot of we lost a lot of people um, because we were not able to reach or contact them at the end of the study so we were not able to collect that post test and so I think one of the questions the limitations of the study is that it's unclear whether this differential attrition or whether this study attrition might it whether you would observe the same um, changes in health and wellness because we did find that the program um, benefited um, participants health and wellness they reported better subjective health fewer trips to the emergency room and hospital and so it's it's it makes you wonder if if those observed changes would have been seen for the people who um, maybe participated in the program but didn't complete the post test so that's kind of an unknown factor and it's it's a